Hello, you're watching People's Dispatch, and today we are going to be talking about power cuts. Yes, uh, load shedding, as it is called in many parts of the world, at a time when uh, you know energy prices are rising. But certain countries, of course, bearing the brunt much more than certain others. And in this case, we're talking about South Africa, where uh, in the name of load shedding, there have been massive uh, power cuts taking place across the country. People really struggling, especially the poor. So to talk more, talk a bit about this and not and how it, this is not just a question of you know, efficiency of a company or whatever, but a much larger structural problem. We have with us uh, Dr. Vashna Jagannath. She's the Deputy General Secretary of the Socialist Revolutionary Workers Party in South Africa, also a, a political activist and academic. Vashna, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So Vashna, first of all, I mean, uh, at some level, you know, uh, power cuts seem such a global problem, but uh, media reports across for many months now have been pointing to a situation in South Africa, which is which is not just normal or average, it's definitely a very extreme case. So could you maybe first outline what the problem is like in the country right now before we go into some of the reasons? Okay, so, I mean, we've had load shedding since 2007 on and off, but since 2018, it's really picked up. And last year, in fact, we had the most days of load shedding in the country's history. And just in the last two to three months, it's really picked up again with sometimes up to 12 hours a day load shedding. In fact, right now in South Africa, we have more time out of the light than in the light, uh, so to speak. And this has had a huge impact on various things. There's a variety of reasons for this happening. Some of it has to do with infrastructure. Uh, there have not been enough maintenance of infrastructure. There's not enough actual power supply to enter the grid. Uh, a lot of that is due to the various times in which when there was attempts to build new power stations and power sources that was you know not followed through due to a variety of reasons including corruption by the state and its various actors so we've ended up in a situation where even though we have a grid that services of over 80 percent of our population we still aren't able to access that actual e electricity in a very stable way and it's really come to a head in the last uh, six weeks or so Right, Vashna, of course. Now, in this context, <clears throat> you've written an article also for Globetrotter, which People's Dispatch has published, talking about the crisis. But in this context, of course, a lot of questions being asked of ESCOM, which is uh, the provider. So maybe first, could you also take us through, uh, you know, the maybe the politics of the past 15 to 20 years, which has actually brought ESCOM to a situation where it's not being able to provide uh, electricity to a large number of people, in the sense that if someone were to ask, what is the reason, what is the larger reason for this crisis? Uh, what would you say? Well, I think it's the same sort of crisis that you see around the world where you have a large, large extent of neoliberal policies being imposed onto countries, especially countries in the third world who have very little say and control over their infrastructure program, over how they choose to invest in their countries. South Africa, obviously, under apartheid, had used to boast very cheap energy source. I mean, it's still coal that they're using <clears throat> and were using but it was still readily available and that is why our industry was able to actually grow and, and flourish because there was surplus energy but there was only surplus energy obviously because you know 70 percent of the population did not have access to electricity but what happened is um at the moment of 1994 when there was a very uh, liberal very open very democratic constitution put into place what you see happening is that there was a push to have electrification happen across the population. And that was actually very successful and achieved within the space of 10 years. But there was no, because as that was happening, the neoliberal policies were being implemented and there was no real infrastructure investment. And so as the grid started expanding, there was no infrastructure investment. And that is due to the policies that the ANC government had taken on. And they are so wedded to this neoliberalism and this neoliberal model that they don't seem to be able to think outside of it and think about ways in which to invest to keep state-owned entities going. Uh, there's this push to privatize electricity. And I mean, you know, it's not surprising that many within the society who want to think through this often look at it in a much more suspicious way, claiming that in fact, the, in, in various levels, this has been allowed to happen so that we could privatize. And one of the interesting things obviously is, you know, the global push to renewable energies, which obviously everyone wants. 
But the point is that we did not cause the global uh, environmental crisis that we currently have. It's right. countries of the global north that have done so. And we are now meant to pay the price and we cannot afford to do so. So one of the things that's been playing out is this introduction of independent power producers who are working with renewable sources of energy. They are selling it into the ESCOM grid, but at a very high price. So electricity is also not only scarce, and less and, and lower than what we actually require, the price is also increasing. Right. So, Ashwin, in this context, of course, uh, like it's not just a technical issue, it's also clearly a social issue. And uh, as you pointed out in the article, South Africa having uh, perhaps the highest uh, rate of inequality in the world. So, in terms of its social impact, how is it actually kind of playing out right now? Well, I mean, socially, it's had a, a massive impact on people's lives. I mean, economically, the impact is so massive. We've lost up about up over 500 billion rand uh, since 2018, which is about 28 billion US dollars. Uh, apparently, the rates of money that the economy sheds per day per load shedding is around 1 billion rand per day per stage of load shedding. Sometimes if you have two massive stages, then you lose 2 billion rand a day. And that doesn't just impact on an economy that's unequal in terms of the rich and the businesses. It obviously has a terrible impact on the poor who carry the burden and the load of this. And what you find in South Africa is this then has an effect on a whole lot of things, especially around women who have to do the labor you know in south africa like in places like india we have a very large domestic worker um sort of condition and, and labor is taken up a lot of labor for women is taken up in domestic work and that becomes even more onerous because things like washing machines aren't working nothing to assist nothing that's mechanized to assist with the labor of the domestic world is actually working so that's a burden on women it also leads to a lot of um, instability in terms of what employment you can have. And as you know, the people that are poorest in society usually end up entering into work that's very insecure labor. And so immediately when the economy is losing money, those are the first jobs that are shed. And it's had a massive impact on our unemployment rate. Furthermore, we have over 30.4 million people living below the poverty line in South Africa, and we have a population of 60.6 .6 million people. So that's just around half of the population, and they live on about 75 US dollars a month. And what's, what, what happens is they also, when there is electricity, can't really access electricity because the average cost of electricity for a poor household is around between 60 and $90 per month. So a lot of their salary or earnings or grants that they are receiving will go towards the use of electricity. And you know, from lots of studies, including one that was done in Pakistan on load shedding, it found that it also has a huge psychological and mental impact Right. on people's lives and you also find that happening right Washington. so in this context of course when you look at how how escom has performed in recent times there have been some attempts by you know the government Pravin Gordhan, for instance others to sort of blame the unions for raising this kind of you know raising the issue saying that the union's industrial action is what is causing these problems etc mm -hmm. etc et so uh why is uh the government taking this kind of a stance and what what really is the way path forward for escom and the government right now you know, it uh, amazes me how much the trade unions get blamed for everything in society. Uh, this is a pattern that has developed in the South African state recently, in the parastatals and by capital, who yeah. just, and the bourgeois media really latches onto this. There's no understanding of the role of the trade union in society. It's been vilified massively. I mean, we know this has happened since the rise of Thatcherism in the world. But in South Africa, we had a very different relationship to trade unions. But that's changing now with this rise of neoliberalism really entrenching itself within the South African landscape. And there does not seem to be in the bourgeois media space any sort of gap for the trade unions to actually get their say and for, to be represented on what it is they're actually doing. So when we go on strikes or when there's labor action in order for people to have better wages, which happens probably for two days of an entire year or every three years, they are blamed for the fallouts in ESCOM. When just logically you have to see there was no strikes for the, the rest of the year, 
and they're still load shedding. Right now, there's no strikes and they're stage six load shedding. So they're just being made into scapegoats when they have very real legitimate concerns. And furthermore, the trade unions have actually offered really good proposals on how to resolve this issue around load shedding. Um, there's also a huge policy and a lot of work that the trade union I work with, uh, the National Union of Metal Workers South Africa, NUMSA, has actually provided in terms of having socially, socially owned renewable projects, something right. that will democratize it rather than firstly take away jobs and increase electricity prices, which is what the IPPs would effectively do. Right. So, uh, but the, does the government have any other solution right now to accept privatization? Has there been any attempted, attempted consultation, any sort of vision that they put forward? No, they seem to be completely visionless in every possible way, uh, not just when it comes to ESCOM. In South Africa at the moment, they seem to be visionless in every possible way in terms of any aspect to do with our society, whether it's the economy, whether it's ESCOM, whether it's education, whether it's crime, any of that. And they found themselves incredibly flat footed. Just yesterday, they announced a new board. Uh, by the way, the chairperson of the board is also chairperson of a private bank and one of the four largest banks in South Africa. And they've not really pushed any sort of socially owned right. agenda. Um, and they don't seem to, they seem to be following the same method. And they also have stated that if they had to follow the new emissions act uh, around coal burning, we might even have up to 15 hours a day wow. load shedding. And they don't know how to resolve this matter. And they also don't seem to know how to address this in a sustained manner for the future. Thank you so much, Vashna, for talking to us and explaining the nature of the crisis in South Africa. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching People's Dispatch.